for this lecture, for current purposes, we're going to define psychiatry as follows. It's a practice led by medically trained practitioners centered on a clinical encounter between an expert the psychiatrist and the patient who goes by many names these days prioritizes diagnosis which is a categorical concept so you have schizophrenia or depression or bipolar disorder it's a category it's not a continuum for example and the diagnosis will indicate the course of treatment for an individual patient and that's what most people think of when they think about seeing a psychiatrist but the clinic is part of and shaped by a whole psychiatric apparatus. It's surrounded by professional bodies, training courses, and an industry of research, some of which takes place here, and lavish research funding, symbiotic with a large area of journals published for profit, integrated with professional careers and, and many other things, and linked to a hugely profitable global apparatus for researching, developing, and marketing drugs, psychotropic drugs, of which more later. Um, and the other thing, it probably has struck you reading the newspapers and stuff, psychiatrists as experts pop up everywhere. They're not confined to the hospital or confined um, to a community mental health team. They pop, in the law, pop up in the law, in education, in the workplace, school, work, family, everywhere we govern contact, conduct, they're the psychiatrists. And psychiatric ways of thinking, and this will become important later, and forms of expertise are everywhere. They infuse all aspects of contemporary life. We may not realize it, but we do. We are shaped by these ways of thinking that we're going to talk about. Now, there's many criticisms of contemporary psychiatric theory and practice, um, diagnosis, its therapeutic capacity, especially maintenance medication. Should people be taking very powerful drugs for their whole lives? with the adverse effects that they have. There's a focus on the distressed individual rather than the social determinants of individual distress. And there are doubts, I think, which refer to over the borders of normality as such. But if you step back and take a look at the conjuncture, there actually aren't that many signs of success right now. There are vast increasing numbers of people taking psych psychiatric drugs worldwide. In the global north, mostly prescribed by general practitioners, task shifting takes place in the global south. Pharma, pharmacological indi industry, is withdrawing from developing central nervous system drugs, apart from those for Alzheimer's type conditions. You can ask why. Um, anxiety and depression are seemingly on the rise worldwide. You look at these epidemiological studies and there's just more and more and more of it. Increasing numbers of especially children waiting for specialist treatment or being sent 600 miles away from home to an eating disorders unit because it's in the bed anywhere else. Um, stigma and discrimination. Despite strategy to normalize mental health, I, that is to say that mental health problems are normal things. But still, we have a lot of stigma and discrimination. And there are acrimony is debates over almost all psychiatric diagnosis and treatments. But our aim today isn't to critique contemporary psychiatry or psychiatrists, although we do have plenty of criticisms. We'd rather be positive and sketch the outline of an alternative future for a psychiatry. Thank you very much for inviting us and thank Russell for his very generous introduction. Uh, you'll see we'll be popping up uh, alternately. We have tried to colour code the slides so that we know which ones we're supposed to be doing. Uh, but as Diana said, we haven't done this for many, many, many years. So in this talk, what we're going to do is we're going to look very briefly at some putative alternatives to the clinical dominance of medically trained experts.
we're going to review the attempts uh, to engage psychiatry with the voice of the patient and lived experience. And that, of course, resonates quite uh, importantly with the remarks that Russell made at the beginning about the importance of listening to the voice. We're going to outline our approach to epistemic injustice in psychiatry. We're going to say briefly a few things about public health psychiatry and the conception of social determinants of mental distress. We're going to discuss the thorny issue of coercive powers of psychiatry, uh, because, because of course I'm sure you all know that psychiatry, apart from the criminal justice system, is the one set of apparatuses that has the power to coerce, to detain and to forcibly treat. Uh, and we're going at the end to outline uh, our own, five, what we call 5E approach to situating uh, mental distress in its social context. And we're going to conclude by asking what this might mean for a different future for psychiatry and psychiatrists. Now, since that's an awful lot and we haven't got a lot of time, uh, let me just say what we're going to try and argue for. First, three fundamental shifts. First of all, an epistemological shift, a radically new way of understanding the contribution of knowledge about both causes and treatment, which is produced by users and survivors of psychiatry. Secondly, a strategic shift, a recognition that adverse social experiences play a part, if not the key role, in the pathways that lead people uh, individually and groups to uh, mental distress. And third, political, because if we're going to act on the kinds of approaches and arguments that we're making here, uh, we need to start to dismantle uh, the psychiatric apparatus that holds the present in place and in particular to ask our psychiatric colleagues to cede some of their authority, if not all their authority, in relation to mental health strategies to social rather than biomedical expertise. Uh, now, there are many alternatives that have been posed to psychiatry, which uh, share something with the arguments that we're going to make today. And because of time constraints, we're going to say something very briefly about them, but we'd be very happy to say more about them in questions, if, other words, uh, if people want. <clears throat> Mostly these alternatives have focused on the clinical encounter. Some of you may know the term post-psychiatry, associated in particular with the work of Pat Bracken. Post-psychiatry argues that and this is not alone, of course, uh, that distress is meaningful in the context of everyday life. And they argue that in order to grasp that meaning of distress in everyday life, psychiatry needs to move out of the hospital and out of the clinic into the everyday life of patients. Home treatment became the key message of post-psychiatry, that patients should remain in their home and the clinicians should come and visit them in their home and understand uh, their situation in the real life that they, uh, that they inhabited. But as we'll see again and again and again, this idea, radical idea of post-psychiatry became quite rapidly recuperated and keeping patients in their own home became a way of managing the acute shortage of psychiatric drugs and the role of the attention of the professional was largely to risk assess patients who are in their own home and make sure they were taking their medication. Some of you may have come across another approach which had quite a lot of publicity recently called Open Dialogue, which was uh, pioneered in small communities in rural Finland. Uh, open Dialogue involved a kind of group therapy and support system which involved the whole family and the whole community in a series of open discussions with the person experiencing mental distress. And in that way tried again to locate that mental distress and the experience of distress in the relationships within that small community. Now I don't know how many of you know the small communities in rural Finland, but they are quite small. And the possibility of exporting this is now being tried, exporting this to even a, uh, a city like Canberra, let alone Melbourne or let alone London, uh, has, yet to be, uh, has yet to be demonstrated. Um, and also because uh, the expression of mental disorders in Finland is probably not the same as the expression of mental disorders in other places. Most recently, quite a lot of publicity has been given to the so-called power, threat and meaning, 
uh, framework, one of a number of psychological alternatives to psychiatric uh, dominance, perhaps part of a power struggle between the psychologist and the psychiatrist as to who has the right to understand and uh, control uh, the question of treatment. In Power, Threat and Meaning, uh, the, the expert, now a psychologist, tries to formulate the client's distress in terms of traumatic experiences enacted by powerful others. What has been done to you and by whom is their leading argument? Something has been done to you and that's the reason why you're experiencing this distress. Uh, and Power threat of meaning has become part of a growing trauma industry, the psychologization of distress in opposition to the medicalization of distress. And in the course of this, the threshold, the barrier for what is considered to be traumatic has been lowered and lowered and lowered, and the expert reinterprets the patient's past in terms of something somewhere that must have caused them trauma. Now, our argument is that neither uh, none of those three really address the fundamental questions of power, knowledge, and expertise in psychiatry. There were some other attempts, the public and patient uh, involvement in the UK, which I don't really want to talk about now for time. Perhaps many of you will have come across the recovery approach, a really radical approach started by service users like Patricia Deegan and Mary O'Hagan. This saw recovery as a collective endeavor requiring a radical shift in the power relation between professionals and users. Again, recognizing that symptoms are often, if not always, an intelligible uh, re response to certain context-bound problems in a user's life world and experience. But I think fundamental to the recovery uh, approach was the argument against normalization. It should be up to an individual to choose the form of life that they want. If you like, expanding the bandwidth of acceptable forms of life rather than imposing a particular form of life that happens to characterize the, the life world of most of us living in advanced industrial societies today. There are many different ways of being human. Unfortunately, again and again, one sees recuperation here. Recovery was turned into an individual treatment. Recovery houses trying to bring a patient along through a normalizing journey towards a normal version of life, in particular life of independence, dependency being seen as pathological, a life of autonomy, a life of choice, a life of self-advancement, norms about how to live which were not set by the client but by the professionals involved. So radical alternatives are all too often uh, recuperated to business as usual. Business as usual, in our view, is not a solution, it's the problem. Right, so Nick has alluded to what's called PPI, uh, patient and public involvement. In, in this case, in research, although it could be patient and public involvement in policy, uh, the idea that the voice of the patient should be part of the discourse it decides what forms of policy and what kinds of support and what kind of treatment um, people will receive. What can we learn from listening to the voice of the patient? Not as a decontextualized individual, not a special person standing up telling their life story about how their, their symptoms melted away when they went on the course of olanzapine or that kind of thing, but actually a movement of people who experience psychiatric treatment or mental distress have discussed it together with each other, have come up with their own analysis and forms of knowledge of, of what it is to be distressed and what kind, what's wrong, or what's on offer currently, and what do we do to put it right? So Nick said, can this voice create and present an alternative knowledge base for action? You're going to hear a lot about knowledge and epistemics. Um, most radical movements in practice don't think there's any point in listening to the voice of the patient. Psychiatrica Democratica, which was bizarrely an attempt to close the Italian Psychiatric hospitals didn't allow for autonomous service user or survivor groups. 
Anti-psychiatrists found meaning in their patients' delusions, but it was their interpretations, not the patient's interpretations, that prevailed. Formulation very much the same, to reframe the patient's experience in professional categories without going into detail. And as, as Nick said, says, some psychological approaches take such reframing to extremes. Um, I have actually stayed in a recovery house. And what they, the things they made me do to be normal, you would not believe. No, um, there's no time for, for detail. Uh, being normal was what you had to be. Um, so why? Why do these leading critical professionals not want to listen to the voice of the patient? Of course, some people who me in this room think that the silence has been broken. And there was a time when I thought the silence had been broken, but I've become cynical and I don't think it has. Um, The key thing for us is the doubt that those who experience mental distress have valid knowledge at all. It's a moral position as well as a cognitive position. And Miranda Fricker calls it epistemic injustice. Injustice at the level of knowledge. Um, I've said that symptoms can be accorded meaning by experts, but to approach distress in, in real lives, we need more than that. We need more than that in research and in the clinic. And I have just written a blog for um, something called Psychiatry on the Margins and argued that service user knowledge, service user research, it occupies a different epistemic space to conventional psychiatry, and that they're actually on a collision course. Um, and none of the alternatives that Nick referred to have attempted to grasp that epistemic space. They reduce it to the individual story. I, I just So increasingly, this, this space is called lived experience. And I do believe it was in Australia that this term um, came into being. And there, there, but there's a, there's a problem. Because on the one hand, when people talk about lived experience, they're talking about something raw and immediate and authentic and coming from the heart. But for us, lived experience isn't like that. It's never raw. It's all shaped by beliefs, by languages, by expectations, by intentions, by adversity in many people's cases. So from our perspective, and I'm sure not everybody will agree, the experience of mental health service users needs to be understood as a collective concept. An inclusion after centuries of exclusion has got to be placed in the context of power. Too many papers are written about collaboration and co-production that don't mention power. They're all easy to do, fit together. Um, as I said, a basic power imbalance in the psychiatric encounter comes down to knowledge. And Miranda Fricker identifies two types of what I call epistemic injustice. The first type is what she calls testimonial injustice. And that is that people, individuals, people, groups, are not seen as credible at the level of knowledge. So they may say, a few things that are a bit off the wall, I say it in a rambly sort of way, but that leads to doubts about the truth, the veridicality, the basis of everything they say. They're not credible knowers. A formidable for form of power, I think. It's because it's saying what can count as valid knowledge, which of course is an enormous subject going back to the enlightenment, to the, the, the privileging of rationality and all that. The second thing that, that Miranda Fricker said, I actually think is more important, although most papers in mental health focus on testimonial injustice, hermeneutic injustice. 
By which she means, or I mean, there's no publicly available discourse in which to articulate our experience. There's no publicly available narrative to talk about how we're treated and all that follows from this in society as a whole. And that's kind of sometimes been called a hermeneutic lacuna. So in public discourse, there is a gap. And that gap is the representation of people who experience distress and responses to it. I'll be quick about this. In fact, I might cut it. Um, just to say that people talk about the perfect dialogue. We can have a perfect dialogue, patience and and professionals, because we all speak the same language. Well, the fact is we don't. Language comes in different registers. There's a register of research, you all speak it. There's a register of law, and there's a vernacular register. And if you don't share the register you speak, or in plural registers, with other people, it's the person who has the power, whose meanings will prevail they will paint the picture of what it means to be a mental patient and how they should be treated. Um, there always entails power. Um, one party has the authority to make decisions to which the other is subject. There is something called shared decision making, which supposedly is an equal shared conversation between experts I'm patient. I do not believe it exists. <laughs> now, it's not very often that you hear people say that forms of method, like randomized control trials or epidemiology or participatory research, have anything to do with power. I mean, they're science, aren't they? They're, they're method. They're, but the apparent neutral search for facts is underpinned by, by what we're calling strong orienting frameworks. Diagnosis, mental pathology, neurochemical anomalies, and treatment. The structure is epitomized in the randomized control trial. Uh, it's prized above all else because it's supposed to be neutral. The process of randomization is meant to take away all the confounding factors. Um, despite the fact that many RCTs have been funded by the pharmaceutical industry, which sh shaped their results all right. Now there's a little bit more constraint, but they help shape the field of truth. General public publication bias remains only published the positive re results. And if you get a really good re positive re result, write 80 papers um, in different languages. Um, there's a lot of questions about the evidence from randomized control trials going into the wild, as um, I've forgotten their names. But that to show in a laboratory that an intervention is effective does not mean it will be effective in real life because the conditions are so controlled in a, in a laboratory, that you have none of the mess of screaming children and getting people to school and getting enough food in the house and that gets in the way of your wonderful intervention. Um, yet, they have a key place in psychiatric research, in large part because there's something called the hierarchy of knowledge within the academy, which I'm sure um, you're familiar with. And I won't say the bit about statistics. It, it sounds counterintuitive. It's, it sounds like back to front. And it is actually. But. And this applies to randomized controlled trials. It also applies to epidemiology. So variables that you use in these methods are only as good as their representation of the world. And that the example that comes to mind these days is socioeconomic status. All right, this was invented in the 1950s. Social class is ABC1, whatever, and it was job and education, and it's still used in epidemiological research today. 
in the West when we've got a knowledge economy, a service economy, increasing precarity, zero hours contracts, multiple jobs, in what welfare benefits, the economy just isn't the same as it was 50 years ago. And yet they keep on using this measure. And similar thing could be said about um, psychiatric categories as well. Um, the, the last thing that I want is cracking on um, is to say something about generalizability. Um, the randomized controlled trial is supposed to be neutral, not biased, control for all confounders. Therefore, if a treatment works in South London, it'll work in South Sudan. In other words, context is nowhere in, in these, these arguments. And but there's a lot in the literature at the moment about scaling up. Scaling up interventions tested in the West to the global south. I mean, I, I despair. <laughs> they, of course, I think the inclusion of those with lived experience is important. I spent 30 years trying to do it. Um, but it can be used as a legitimation tactic. So I'll just give a, per a personal example. I once, more than once, found my name on a scientific paper that I had nothing to do with the study. I was not involved in it. But my name was there as one of the authors. It was to legitimate them as doing proper PPI. That was what it was for. Um, right. um, and as I said as well, collaboration, co-production, we don't see these systemically um, as groups, structured groups of people working together. What it's reduced to is individual people telling their individual story. And they know it. They know they're being exploited. Um, research findings from participatory methods are absent. Um, they don't count as knowledge. And as I've said, survival voices are raised in the methods um, of research, even though we're being told the silence is being broken. Epistemic injustice is very um, personal to me because I'm a sort of academic, sort of survivor, and I've got the nerve to tread on the world of knowledge. Um, so the mad scientist isn't just a joke. She's an oxymoron. So let's move towards the social. Of course, if you speak to almost any psychiatrist, any clinical psychiatrist, they will know that there are social determinants of mental distress. And when I was at King's College London and elsewhere, I've had many attempts at collaborating with psychiatrists and being on training courses with psychiatrists. And they say, yes, we know that there are social determinants of mental distress, and we try to take those into account. But all we have in front of us is intervention on a troubled individual. So all we can do is treat these as background factors, background factors to the diagnosis and the treatment of the individual. But they also know, and epidemiological research has demonstrated again and again and again, that mental distress is fundamentally linked to precarious forms of life. Most people the vast majority of people, if you think at population level, rather than individual level, at population level, what you see again and again is the importance of poverty, of poor housing, of precarious jobs, of hostile welfare systems, of polluted environments, of social exclusion, of isolation, stigma, racism, and much more from birth until adulthood and indeed uh, between generations. And I think this is actually relevant in the Australian context in the discussion of intergenerational trauma, which I know plays quite a big part in some of the debates here. If you look at disease risk more generally, you find that epidemiological studies show that between 70% and 90% of disease risk is attributable to environmental exposures. So in this sense, it doesn't make any uh, scientific sense to think about enclosed individuals in relation to an external environment. The environment is within us, 
We live it, we breathe it, and we suffer it, we get ill from it, and we die from it. These lessons, the lessons of social medicine, put forward over a period of 50 years by people like Thomas McEwen, Paul Farmer, Michael Marmot, are nodded to, they're, they're recognized, but they have proved extremely difficult to enact. Because what's in front of a psychiatrist is something very proximate, a proximate risk factor. You, had, you experienced domestic violence, you experienced bad housing, and that's what put you in a situation of distress. Now, the, one of the people who I think is really good working in this area is a, a, a psychiatric researcher, an epidemiologist called Sandra Galea. And Sandra Galea and Laura Sampson wrote a very interesting paper a few years ago. And the message of that paper was, I'll just read it out, if, to extend, if we are to extend beyond proximate risk factors, we must broaden our causal models and learn to apply a social ecological perspective, a focus on exposures that are pervasive, ubiquitous, and hence difficult to study. Examples include social or cultural norms, urbanization, discrimination, political structures, air pollution, poverty, climate change, and migration patterns. If you're going to look at population levels, and if you're concerned with population level experience of mental distress, then these are the things that you have to talk about. Of course, many psychiatrists do claim to do social psychiatry. They're aware of social factors, but what's meant by the social in social psychiatry? It's transformed into an external environment, which is a provoking factor or a protective factor, which works on an underlying biological or organic constitution. Hence, G times E. Phenotype is related to the interaction between genes and environment. The structure of the argument does not change. Subjects with this genomic feature or this uh, this organic feature exposed to this environmental insult in childhood are more likely to be diagnosed with this condition in adulthood. Again, this is a highly individualistic way of looking at these things, and all too often it's the behavior of the individuals, the inadequate mother, the problematic family, the cannabis smoker, who are the target of intervention and prevention. <clears throat> Now, we aren't arguing for an end to clinical work in mental health. Some will suffer so extremely uh, that they'll need individual attention. But this should always be combined with a strategy to address at least the proximal social and environmental pressures that have triggered their distress. But more than that, we argue that psychiatric professionals should use their authority to intervene more widely in housing, in finance, in work, not just individually, but also at the community level and political. Now, some do do it individually. They pick up the phone and they talk to the housing department. They pick up the phone and they talk to the school. But it seems beyond their role to engage as a profession uh, in struggling against these social issues which are constitutive of the problem itself, not just of the problem of the particular individual they have in front of them. So we argue for an approach which is grounded in social medicine, which looks at what some anthropologists have termed social suffering, what Paul Farmer, the late Paul Farmer of Harvard uh, Global Health and Social Medicine, refers to as the causal role of structural violence. Mental distress, we argue, arises from the actual social material experience of individuals as they make their lives in the spaces and places which they live, the small-scale biopsychosocial niches, if you want to call them that, in which people make their lives. And we have to look at how these multiple pathogenic exposures get under the skin and afflict the body and soul across time. And we have to listen to the voices of those who experience distress about what they find pathological and what they might find as salutogenic, as health-promoting in the reality of their everyday lives. Now, perhaps many years of medical training doesn't equip psychiatrists to think about such things apart from in uh, the terms of uh, uh, an everyday guardian reader, uh, but perhaps it should. So this is what we call our 5E approach to mental health. Of course, and I've done a lot of work recently uh, over the last years on neurobiological approaches, 
uh, to cognition, to emotion, etc., etc., etc. And no one is denying that the brain has a part to play when people experience distress. But the brain has a part to play when I'm standing here in front of you or when I'm trying to walk up and down the stairs and so on. To say that things are in brain doesn't mean that they should be tackled at the level of the brain, let alone at the level of the individual synapse targeted by serotonin or the, uh, the, even the, the individual um, uh, co uh, cortical problems that, uh, 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 that someone diagnosed with a dementia is experiencing. We need to understand these things as extended, in place, embodied, experienced, and enacted. That's what we mean by the five, or what I'm trying to develop as this five-E approach to mental health. Some of you who worked in the cognitive sciences may be familiar with four E movements in cognitive science. It's kind of related to those kinds of arguments. Yes, mental distress is certainly embrained but it's also extended across the network of material and social supports within which people make their lives. Uh, the, what James Gibson calls the affordances, the properties of the environment that enable and constrain certain types of action, the scaffolds that people rely upon in order to enact their experience, both material and social. It's in place. Now, there's a lot of work recently being developed on the concept of the exposome, uh, especially in relation to physical health. All the exposures experienced across a lifetime, exposures to pollution, exposures to noise, exposures to uh, poor food and water, etc., etc., etc. But in these arguments about exposures, there's very little attention to other kinds of exposures, exposures to violence, exposures to social exclusion, exposures to isolation, exposures to racism. So we do need to place the individual in the context of multiple exposures that impinge upon them from the moment of birth. Uh, but we need to recognize that those exposures are not just things like air pollution, which is incredibly important and getting increasing publicity, but the social exposures which we've talked about. We are beginning to understand the ways in which these exposures are embodied, the way in which they get under the skin, the way in which they activate or deactivate certain genetic pathways, the way in which they contribute to or they, dis they don't contribute to the development of new neurons. We're beginning to understand the way in which stress, although a very complicated term, modifies neural circuits, activates the immune system, produces genetic changes. We're beginning to understand the gut-brain axis and the way in which the microbiome has a key role in mental health. We're beginning to understand the role of inflammation as another thing which uh, has a key role in, uh, in, in developing certain kinds of mental distress. We're beginning to understand the neurobiological pathways through which these exposures get under the skin. So thinking of this way about social exposures is not thinking against neurobiology, but it's thinking about how you put the brain and the body and the environment together again in the holistic way in which human beings actually live their lives, in the ways in which they make sense of the worlds in which they live. And the worlds in which individuals live are not material worlds, they're thought worlds. The experience that an individual has of the world is shaped, not just brute facts, but saturated by meanings uh, that enable them to get through their lives. And in this work, I don't have time to talk about it now, but I've drawn upon some earlier work by Stan Milgram and uh, Kevin Lynch to get individuals to trace mental maps of the environments in which they live and to find out the places within their environments which they find helpful, which they find restful, which they find uh, 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 productive of health, and those which are associated with dread, with fear, with trauma, and with delight. And you can actually begin to trace that out with individuals and groups. These maps indicate something about human being, how individuals enact their lives, how they live their lives in adversity, not as the kind of isolated variables that Diana talked about in relation to epidemiological research, but as a complex set of time and space within which people make their existence. Now, if you try to think about things in that way, how are we doing for time? If you try to think about things in that way, it sometimes seems that you can only make change at a very large scale. 
And that often leads to people thinking, but what can I do? Uh, but there are changes. There are small changes that can affect the reality of people's lives. And there are changes in the political environment, in the welfare environment, in the housing environment, in the architectural environment, which may uh, radically transform the way in which people live. And perhaps we can say a little bit more about those later on. Intervention by Psi professionals may be invaluable in a crisis, but long-term intervention, in particular long-term intervention with psychiatric drugs, may actually entrench the problems which they try to treat. We'll say a little bit more if we have a chance to get to that uh, when we get to the end, but uh, we would be remiss if we didn't say a little bit about the thorny question of coercion. Psychiatry can take away your liberty and give, subject you to treatments that you don't want, like being held on the floor by six nurses and injected with sedative drugs that put you to sleep for 24 hours. That's supposed to be good for you. Um, that's, psychiatry can do that. The rest of medicine can't do it. If you don't want a treatment, you don't have it. Um, some people argue involuntary detention and treatment should cease, like the Convention for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Others argue psychiatrists should retain this power to prevent psychiatric patients harming themselves or others. One rarely hears the voice of the patient. Just a some work I did, focus groups of service users who'd been in hospital within the previous two years and with nurses, and they saw things very differently. The service users saw they got out of control or kicked off because they were caged like animals, locked in a tiny space for weeks. In other words, there was a reason why they were becoming violent or, becoming, or kicking off. The nurses didn't see it that way. The nurses saw such behavior as the expression of an illness, a symptom to be medicated away by force if necessary. So treating people with respect is, to my mind, incompatible with the forced injection of sedative drugs. Um, there are many things that people have tried that in, in, in particular units that have reduced the um, level of violence, like de-escalation techniques, those kinds of, of conversations. Um, but what do you do in the rare cases where somebody with a psychiatric diagnosis harms or threatens another. And it is rare. It's no more likely to happen with somebody with a diagnosis than with the rest of the population. Treat them like any other criminal in jail them, or increase high, for, high security forensic units for dangerous individuals. These are like terrible alternatives. We think that there should be an a complete overhaul of the acute care system, an overhaul of the fabric, the architecture, and, and of the way in, in which they are run. This has been done in Trieste, um, open door, no restraint system, and 24 community mental, our community mental health services in Trieste can manage persons who previously have been detained. But I don't think I can go into detail. I just think you've got to scrap it. And, and, and start again. Obviously, you can't do it overnight, but start by pulling down the big hospitals. So, is, it, is this you? No, I'll do it if you like. <laughs> okay, to summarize, switch research funding to interdisciplinary investigations to map the shaping of stressors by collective experiences of adversity. And there you have them, the kind of thing that Nick has talked about, everything from noise and smell and touch to violence and racism, the urban infrastructure, and which you can study ethnographically. I don't think you meant epidemiologically. Um, 
and at a, politi a policy level, work with others to develop policies and practice to transform the neo-ecosocial pathways, promote anti-poverty measures like cash transfers or universal basic income, promote unconditional welfare systems to address precarity, promote public health measures to address exposures at a population level like smoking and cancer did. Support local scaffolds to mental health. Have more safe spaces. I think somebody's got from my workshop looking at safe spaces. Local cafes, play areas, drop-in centers. Uh, a change in the feel, atmosphere, and experience of the community. It may seem like a dream, but it has been done. Right, so it's not that psychiatrists are unaware of these systemic structural forces. But they have a tough job. We do recognize that they have a tough job. They have far too many people to treat and they're working in cramped spaces. Very difficult work. So if structural violence, intergenerational trauma, social suffering and the voice of the patient were recognized as foundational to psychiatry for the experience of both severe and mental dis and severe mental distress. The question is, would the medical discipline of psychiatry still be allotted its key role in understanding and treating mental disorders? They would have to start self-reflecting questioning the claims that they are the exponents of effective neurobiological based targeted treatment of brain disorders, serotonin, whatever, like other biomedical specialities, which DSM has been promising for 20 years, and it still hasn't happened. Um, it means what Thomas Kuhn called a paradigm shift, a paradigm shift in knowledge and also in practice, and moves towards paradigm shifts are always resisted, usually by people saying it's wishful thinking. But they're resisted precisely because they identify fundamental problems with normal science. And as Kuhn himself recognized, the time before a paradigm shift is replete with dangers. And I've been doing somewhere. I think the mainstream is cracking. The current paradigm is cracking. This is a new paper in The Lancet by Vikram Patel, of all people, and some others. Um, and they argue that the current paradigm of the psychiatry is not working globally or locally. Business as usual has failed and will continue to do so. Vikram Patel is no radical. He's a mainstream. Um, important person. <laughs> so alternative, alternative requires psychiatry to reject the claim that it has a monopoly of knowledge. The psychiatric curriculum should be built around as ideas of what Jonathan Metzl calls cultural, uh, structural competency. Not understanding people's culture, but understanding their conditions of life, material and, and symbolic. Um, psychiatrists must often be subordinate to other non-medical forms of expertise. Experts in housing, finance, hostility of different crimes like patriarchy and racism, politics and injustice. And we need the expertise of users and survivors of current mental health services. And I think things are cracking and bubbling under the surface. A move to epistemic justice demands that the voice of the patient and the experienced reality of the patient is central to any system of supports. Engaging the expertise of patients, not just another voice, but radically altering the perspective as a whole. Can we have multiple expertise without hierarchies? Can we have a team without a, a manager? 
Well, history tells us it's pretty difficult, but it is a question. Could you have multiple expertise without hierarchy? So there are two alternative conclusions to this long talk. Perhaps another psychiatry is possible along the lines we sketched, or perhaps the role we're suggesting for psychiatry is so far away from the medical that another medical psychiatry is not possible. Either way, we're talking of a paradigm change as radical and all-encompassing, more so, in fact, as a move away from the asylum, a complete reshaping of the psychiatric apparatus and the powers of psychiatry, a radical shift in the way we see, research, talk about, intervene, dialogue, the conditions that produce and the conditions that ameliorate mental distress. Thank you.